Although forensic science has achieved many groundbreaking milestones in the past, investigators' work is still a battle against time. In countries like Germany, the clear-up rate for homicides is between 91 and 95 percent. What initially sounds like an outstanding value means in reality 5 to 9 out of 100 murder cases remain unsolved. And with them, the cruel fates and the suffering that the victims had to go through in the last moments of their lives. Together with you, we would like to look at several moving incidents that still keep investigators and relatives from sleeping at night. Before we get started, be sure to hit the like button and ring the notification bell for more videos. Also, stick around until the end to learn about one of the most mysterious unsolved cases so far. The Lady of the Dunes It's July 26, 1974, when 12-year-old Leslie Medcalf makes a horrifying discovery in Provincetown, Massachusetts. When the girl is walking her friend's dog, she sees the lifeless body of a woman among the dunes. But that's not all. The corpse was in a horribly battered state, the woman's hands had been severed, and the severe head injuries also clearly showed the unknown person had not died of natural causes. In addition, it appeared that she had been forcefully penetrated with a piece of wood. After Leslie reported her horrific find, the police immediately began investigating. However, all the surveys in the neighborhood, the comparison with thousands of missing person cases, and the facial recognition with clay models would not provide any new insights. The fate and identity of those killed remained unknown, so that in the following decades she was only referred to as the Dune Woman or the Lady of the Dunes. However, Almost 50 years have passed since this moving incident, and during all this time, investigative and scientific techniques have continued to develop. To put it into context, in the 70s, forensic science had not even dared to dream of something like a DNA test. And a few weeks ago, a report hit the headlines that everyone who had worked hard to decipher the case had been longing for the murder victim could finally be identified. Nearly half a century after the body was found, investigative genealogy helped give Doom Woman her real name back. Accordingly, this is Ruth Marie Terry, who was 37 years old at the time of her death. Investigative genealogy combines DNA analysis with traditional genealogical research and historical records to uncover new clues about unsolved crimes. While the identification of Ruth Terry is a major breakthrough, that doesn't mean the mysterious case has been solved at this point. After all, we still have no idea who brutally mauled the woman and violently tore her life away. All we know is that Ruth was born in Tennessee in 1936. It also suggests that the wife and mother also had connections to California, Massachusetts, and Michigan. The Massachusetts Police Department is asking the public to look at Ruth's wanted posters and immediately forward any information about the case to investigators. In the course of time, however, a wide variety of theories about the deceased and her killer emerged. This is how some people would like to have recognized Ruth in a scene from Steven Spielberg's Jaws. In 2000, convicted hitman Hayden Clark drew attention to himself when he claimed to have killed the Dune Woman. At this point, Clark was already in prison on charges of murdering a 6-year-old girl and a 23-year-old woman. However, since the statements could not be supported by circumstantial evidence or any evidence at all, and because Clark was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, this supported lead also came to nothing. According to another theory, Ruth fell victim to Boston gangster James Whitey Bulger. In fact, this is said to have been seen in Provincetown in the summer of 1974 and in the company of a lady who looked very much like the Dune Woman. In addition, Bulger severed the teeth and hands of one of his victims to make identification using dental records and fingerprints impossible. Although the mafioso, who was caught by the FBI in 2011, was not officially a suspect, the police investigated the theories from the population without finding a connection to the murder of Ruth Terry. Zygmunt Adamski 
In the summer of 1980, Trevor Parker, as so often, entered his father's coal yard in the English Todd Morton, but then his gaze suddenly met something terrible. The corpse of a man was lying on a three-meter high pile of coal. The dead man was quickly identified as minor Zygmunt Adamski, who had disappeared without a trace five days earlier. The then 56-year-old had lived with his wife in a town that was a good 30 kilometers from the site. The last time Sigmund was seen alive was on June 6, 1980. At that time, he had left to go shopping at a nearby supermarket. On the way there, he had a relaxed chat with a neighbor. The police examined Zygmunt's body. They became aware of some odd details. A grimace of sheer fear was branded into the dead man's face. In addition, it seemed as if Zygmunt had not shaved for a day at most, even though he had been missing for five days. In addition, the body had some strange burns on the neck where an unknown ointment had been applied. Who or what took Zygmunt's life is unclear. Rumors of a family drama, a KGB plotter circulating, and some people even believe that he was abducted by aliens. In fact, several reports of strange lights in the night sky emerged during the same period. Leo Whitaker What happened to Leo Whitaker? We have been asking ourselves this question ever since the 86-year-old disappeared without a trace in 2001. The elderly gentleman had previously stayed at a holiday resort in Costa Rica. With his wife, Leo had traveled to many different countries to volunteer to help build churches and schools. This was also the case almost exactly 21 years ago. On November 18, 2001, Leo's group made a stopover in a suburb of San Jose to recharge their batteries in a thermal bath. Leo's wife Virginia wanted to take one last dip in the hot springs before continuing to the north of the country. The retired workaholic preferred to wait that long on a roadside bench. When Virginia returned after half an hour, she couldn't believe her eyes. There was no sign of her husband. After the missing person could not be found anywhere, the other members of the group carried out a large-scale search operation, but no sign of life from Leo could be found for miles. Even combing the nearby jungle yielded no clues. To this day, no one knows what really happened to the elderly gentleman. Jim Thompson on Easter Sunday, 1967, Jim Thompson decided to go hiking in Malaysia's Cameron Highlands. At the time, no one could have guessed that the son of a prominent Delaware family would never return from the trip. Known as the Silk King of Thailand, Jim had built a lucrative business after his time in the military and American foreign policy. Shortly before his disappearance, the successful businessman had stayed in the Moonlight Bungalow with a longtime acquaintance. In the afternoon of Sunday, March 26, 1967, Jim decided to go for a walk. After the 61-year-old did not appear again, an intensive search operation was launched, in which more than 500 helpers took part. However, the action had to be canceled around 11 days later without any result. To this day, the wildest speculations about the whereabouts of the entrepreneur are circulating. Although no ransom note was ever received, many believe Jim was kidnapped. Others believe murder is more likely, and still others suspect he voluntarily disappeared to attend to a secret government project. Michael Malinowski Westchester, Pennsylvania is located very close to Pine Creek Gorge, also known as the Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania. Westchester was hosting a psychology conference on the week of October 21, 1996, and this is the reason why Michael Malinowski was visiting the area for a few days before he unexpectedly went missing. This case was covered on the YouTube channel True Crime Stories with Ty Knotts, so if you'd like a deeper analysis of this case, be sure to check out that channel channel for a deep dive into the disappearance of Michael Malinowski. Michael had been attending the aforementioned psychology conference in Westchester, Pennsylvania, which was heavily based on men's issues, but no one has ever clarified what this really entailed. While staying downtown for the conference, 
Michael had rented a room about 200 miles away at Pine Tree Lodge in Gaines, Pennsylvania. The lodge had originally been built in the 1930s, and it doesn't seem that it had been updated too much since then. The lodge was also surrounded by several thousand acres of forest and nature preserves, making it the perfect place to unwind and spend time in nature without having to rough it by staying in a tent or camper. Each of the cabins had a covered porch with plenty of access to fishing spots, hunting areas, local festivals, and natural views that you couldn't even imagine. Michael checked into the lodge the same day he arrived for the festival. He entered his room, set down his things, turned on the heater, and spent the night. The next day, he left the lodge to go do something, but he left all of his belongings behind, suggesting he planned on coming back. A look at the lodge records shows that he had, in fact, paid for two nights. However, he never returned for his second night's stay. The following day, a cleanup worker entered the room and found all of Michael's belongings had been left behind. Not knowing what to do about this, she contacted the police and asked for help. The officers collected his things and headed out in search of him. They found that his car wasn't located in the parking lot anymore, so the first step was to find his car, and hopefully, Michael would still be nearby. On November 2, 1996, a Pennsylvania forestry worker found Michael's car, a 1995 Nissan Sentra, parked close to a trail access point at Barber Rock Overlook near the Pine Creek Gorge. What's interesting about this discovery was that police found that Michael's hiking boots were still in the car, suggesting he didn't plan on being away from his vehicle for too long, nor did he plan on going very deep into the forest. Inside of his car, they found a box of half-eaten snacks, water, as well as his backpack with all of his supplies and his cell phone. Considering how bizarre this discovery was, the Tioga County Sheriff's Office immediately picked up the case and began a large-scale search for Michael. According to one of the officers who worked for the Sheriff's Department, their team had never had a case that remained fully unsolved. In every case they had pursued, they had either found a body or found the victim alive. Though, as they would soon learn, the case of Michael Melanowski would be much different. The search team used helicopters, canines, volunteers, and even trained search and rescue teams. In essence, they found nothing, not a single clue that would lead to where Michael had gone. There was a nearby overlook that was on a high cliff with a steep drop-off. One of the officers firmly believed that Michael had fallen down from the overlook, but when they searched the base of the cliff, they still found nothing. Many of the officers felt that, since there was no trace of Michael, he may have staged his disappearance and fled to start a new life somewhere else. However, as far as I can tell, there'd be no reason for him to do this. By all means, Michael had nothing tying him down. Ever since his divorce, he had been living alone and had all the free time he could imagine, outside of his job as a psychologist, that is. If he wanted to leave and start a new life, he could have done this with ease. There would be no reason for him to stage a disappearance. Many investigators believe that there is more to the story that meets the eye, but they simply can't prove it. For one, Michael was known for being a very meticulous and organized person. Person. However, his room at the lodge did not line up with any of his normal habits. His room was quite messy, according to police. This could insinuate that Michael wasn't actually the one who last visited his room that evening. Or it could suggest that something more serious was going on with Michael, and his mind was slipping away from him, be it because he was under the influence of something or under the influence of someone. Though it needs to be noted that, despite these claims of his room being quite messy, others claim that his room was in a perfectly acceptable state. So take that information with a grain of salt. It's difficult to know who is correct here. Either way, the Pennsylvania State Police say that, regardless of the state of his room, they had no reason to believe that foul play was at hand here. One of the experts has debated the theory that Michael had fled the area to start a new life, saying that Michael's friends had openly told officers that he had plans to move closer toward the West Coast quite soon so that he could spend more time with his 10-year-old son. If this is the case, it makes Michael's disappearance all the more strange. It's been over 20 years since Michael disappeared, and no further progress has been made in his case. No evidence was ever found in the woods, nor was there any sign of Michael outside of his vehicle that had been parked near the forest reserve.
What do you think of the puzzling cases we brought to you today? And what are your theories about them? We're already looking forward to your comments. Please give us a like and subscribe to learn more about the most mysterious murder and missing person cases in history. And with that, thanks for watching, have a good one, and see you next time.